Hi, this is homework one for AP Stats. So I'd like you to take notes on here, on the back of here, on a separate sheet of paper, and then staple them. Don't just circle the answers. Okay, let's do it. So the first question is a good review of what a chapter one question would look like on the midterm. So let's take a look. It says a box plot of two data sets are shown, plot one and plot two. Based on this, which one is true? So again, when we take notes, we wanna actually state why it's true and then why the other ones are false because we're using this to study. Okay, so the range of both plots is about the same. Well, if I look at the range, there's no numbers here. So I can't take max minus min, max minus min. So even that is a little confusing. So let's review what that might mean. So another piece of paper, I, I decided to take notes. And um, you can write some of this or just summarize. So it looks like if we look at the data, that the range is the max minus the min. Since we don't know either number, we can compare the distances between the max and min. So this is the range, this is the range, and we see this is about the same. So we see that this is true. But let's say this wasn't obvious to you. We should continue to prove the others false. So let's do just that. So in proving these are false, let's take a look. In B, the question states, the means of both plots are approximately equal. So that's kind of a twi trick question. I'll explain why. We don't get a mean in a box plot. A box plot is actually a five number summary. So if you came to this, you might notice that that's a five number summary is what a box plot is. This number, this number, this number, this number, this number. It's a five number summary and the mean is not one of them. So I would skip this one and we'll come back. All right, what about the next one being false? It says plot two contains more data points than plot one. Well, I definitely have something to say about that. Um, this would be false. We don't know how much data is in a box plot, only a five number summary of the data, unless the problem actually comes out and tells us. So this would have to be false because we don't have a way of knowing that. Now let's look at D. It said the medians are approximately equal. So this is the median and this is the median. Those do not look like the same number at all. So D is very obviously false. The medians aren't the middle line of the box and these are not similar. Now this can help us go back and answer the mean. So it's kind of misleading. It's like, how could you have answered that? So I'm gonna give you some clues to that. Well, technically, Technically, we know from observation that if data is symmetrical, then the means are approximately equal to whatever the median is. Okay, so if the medians are not similar and these do look relatively symmetrical, meaning the stuff on the left looks pretty close to the stuff on the right, the stuff on the left looks close to the stuff on the right, then we can actually conclude that the medians are not equal, therefore the means are not equal because these are both relatively symmetrical. But let's, let's explore this last one. It says plot one is more symmetrical than plot two. Well, let's explore what that means. So, symmetrical means that if I fold it at that line, it will fold on top of itself, its own self. Now, it doesn't look perfect, but it looks relatively close. Both are not perfectly symmetrical, but are relatively symmetrical. And this is why we know that the mean and the mean are probably somewhere close to the same number. The median and the mean are relatively close to each other. 
So if they were getting in a contest, which one's more symmetrical? Neither are perfectly symmetrical. Both are rather symmetrical. So this one's just not the best answer. Okay, next question. Um, so in studying for the midterm, here's a typical question from chapter two. Let's take a look. A child is 40 inches tall, which places her in the 90th percentile of all children of similar age. So that's not tall for an adult, but compared to people of her same age, it is. The heights of the children form approximately normal with a mean of 38. Based on this info, what's the standard deviation? Okay, great question. So we say to ourselves, I can draw a picture like this because they said the word approximately normal. I can put 40, 40 inches tall here because we know that's the 90th percentile. I can also draw a graph like this signifying that because it's the 90th percentile, that means the area under the curve to the left is 0.9. It also would mean that the area of this would be 0.1. Okay, so now we, we have a formula for figuring out some of the things as it relates to problems like these. Our z-score is equal to AP statistics, the actual height, the predicted height, and the standard deviation of the heights. So the actual height was my student, 40. The predicted, well, if we know nothing about the child, we assume that they would be 38 inches high. The standard deviation, that's what we're solving for. So based on this information, it's telling you, you should be able to know the z-score based on what's been given, and you can't. You can look it up in a table. So notice this picture is similar to the one drawn here, and we wanna know the probability or the area under the curve to the left, and we already have that information, it's 0.9. So we search around the table for the area of 0.9, and we find one as close as we can get. So it looks like this one right here, 0.8997, that one's a little bit bigger. This one's as close as it gets. So we scoot over here to the left and we see that that lines up with 0.12. And we scoot up above our number and it's so it's gonna be 0.128. Okay, so we're almost done with this. That's really the end of the mystery. And the rest is algebra. So the z-score is 0.128. That's the z-score that correlates to an area under the curve of 0.09. Now. We can do the swap here. We can move S up here and 129 down there. So swapping those, and again, keep, keep track, that's not a five, it's a letter S for standard deviation. You can also put an S sub X. Um, you'll see that notation. And I solve and I get 1.5625, which is E. Beautiful. Okay, next question. This question would look like a question from chapter three. So how would we answer it? Let's take a look. It says, if you plotted five points, so maybe 222, 10, four, 6, 14, 14, two, 18, negative four. Okay, so I've plotted these five points and they all look relatively close to a straight line. They're kind of bobbling around what you might think of as a straight line. What, which residual will be the largest absolute value? So they're really asking who is the furthest away from the line of best fit? Who's farthest from line of best fit, or we also call that the least squared regression line. Okay. Well, we have a calculator to do that. You could also go to Desmos and type in the four coordinates, and it will give you that information. I took the liberty of typing it in this calculator because it's smaller than my Desmos, 
And we notice it looks like this dot right here is the furthest from the line, and it is the coordinate 10, 4. So the one that had a coordinate 10, 4 is B. Okay, that's one way. But what if they asked me what the actual residual is? So again, if you go back here, how did I get it to graph this? Um, I can show you. I typed in the X values, 2, 10, 6, 14, 18, and Y values, 22, 4, 14, 2, and negative 4. And then I went to menu and had it do the statistics and create a line of best fit. Okay. So after I did that, here's the really interesting thing. It actually calculated the residuals for me. And if I hover right here, see underneath there? It'll tell me the residuals of each point. 1.6. So the residual of A is 1.6, the residual of B is negative 3.6, the residual of C is zero. So it's right, C ended up right on top of our line. The residual of D, 0.08, see where I'm reading that? And E, 1.2. Okay, very cool. So once again, if I think of the absolute value, C is or excuse me, B is below the line of best fit. So I graphed these pretty quickly, but I think this is what it'll look, what it'll look like on Desmos. So B is the furthest away from the line and it's below the line. Way cool. Okay, now let's talk about the last question. So this is a type of question on designing studies, chapter four, that you might see. So let's take some notes. If you're planning an experiment to determine the effect of the brand of gas and the weight on the car measured in gas mileage, you have only one car to test, so cost is limited. But you're interested in finding out whether the three brands of gas will have any effect on three different weights. So it looks like you have two different variables and you're interested in both, which is a really cool experiment. So how would we write out our explanation. I think a good, a good way of explaining this is we start out with our one test car, right? So I can't split him, one test car goes to this gas, this gas, this gas, that's not gonna work. I also don't wanna just automatically start with 3,000 pounds and start with one gas, I've gotta be random about it. So maybe, just the way my car started, maybe toward the beginning of it, I get better gas mileage. And as I continue to drive my car, I get worse or vice versa. So this isn't gonna work because there was no random assignment with our variables here. Start with each of those, it's just not gonna work. Choose gas at random, I like it, and then test the car 3,000, 3,500, and 4,000 in that order. You were not random with the second variable there. So that's a problem. Okay, let's look at these last two. There are nine combos of weight and gasoline. I would agree with that. Run the cars several times using each combination and run them in random. So that would randomize each of your variables. Therefore, each test had an equal chance of getting either of the three gases or either of the three weights in the car. I'm liking this one. Let's look at E. Randomly select the amount of weight and the brand and run the car on a test track. Repeat this for a total of three. You know, I'm liking this one too. However, I'm wanting to test this several times because I don't know if at the beginning of my test run, I'm just gonna get lucky with what, the, I think this would allow us to isolate variables and compare results at the end. So I'm gonna pick D. So you're like, well, what? Notes did you take? Again, this is kind of a good way to take notes on this stuff. So I only have one test car, right? So what is better is to plan, I really have nine types of ways, if that makes sense. And I'm wanting to do random assignment, okay? So I have nine test patterns. So this is gas, one, two, three, and weight, one, two, or three. Gas, one, two, or three, weight, two, gas, one, weight, three, gas, two, weight, one, gas, two, weight, two, 
gas two, weight three, gas three, weight one, gas three, weight two, gas three, weight three. I've got my nine possible outcomes and in order to compare the results, what I'm gonna do is make sure they each have a random opportunity to do so. Thanks for joining us, that's the bell. See you next time.